Hi, we're, we're going to be talking to Samuel Lansford, and uh, this is March 27th, 2008. We're, we're at WILL-TV in Urbana, Illinois. My name is Nancy Rotzel, and the, the uh, person doing all the filming is, is Henry Radcliffe. Okay, let's start out with where were you when Pearl Harbor happened, and how did you feel about it? And, and uh, let's start there. In December of 1941, I was only a boy. I was 13. I was playing with a friend and had older brothers already in the service, but my family, along with uh, our neighbors heard on the radio about Pearl Harbor being bombed. And I remember very well, it was a very sobering moment. I don't know if you want me to launch right into this, but uh, because I was too young to be on active duty in World War II, I was not in uniform on active duty until uh, the days of the Korean War, I can tell an awful lot about what happened on the home front during World War II, and an awful lot did. I'd like to hear us. more about that. I was probably nine when I first became aware of troubles that might be on the horizon. My older brother Scott and I were down on a, an acreage that my father had leased for running sheep and cattle. And for some reason, Papa didn't show up in time and we ended up eating with the old couple that he had living in a little shack there, uh, probably in exchange for their just being there to avoid, uh, to, to keep rustlers from uh, getting any of our livestock. And what state was that? Where were you in the country? If you put your finger squarely in the center of the map of Texas, that's where we were. Now, it's West Texas country. It's more ranching than it is cotton country or a country of pines or lowlands. It's, it's on the high plains. But uh, that's uh, on the county line between Brown and Comanche counties. And uh, it's primarily agricultural. But anyway, the old couple who fed us that night, I remember quite well, they, they were very old, and the man had been reading the paper, and he flapped the newspaper down on the table and said, that old hilter over there in Germany is going to be causing us trouble, mark my words. Well. Our oldest brother, Don, was in advanced ROTC at Texas A&M. And the second son was in his third year in the Navy. My best chum's mother, a school teacher, reflected sadly when she heard that Paris had fallen. She said, oh, that may have been the most democratic government closest to ours in all of Europe. Well, my older brother Don got his commission in the Coast Artillery when he graduated in 1938. The next brother, Rex, came home from the Navy after having served for four years. The third son, Bob, entered A&M, and the fourth, was Scott, and Scott and Rex went on to A&M also. So even though they were not on active duty, uh, there were brothers in uniform all around. In the fall of 1940, President Franklin Roosevelt authorized the mobilization of Texas 36th Division of the uh, National Guard. 
The federal government purchased 123,000 acres of ranch land just 15 miles from where we lived. Now Camp Bowie during World War I had been just west of Fort Worth, but it was being reestablished there on the outskirts of the little town of Brownwood. And in an economy that was just recovering from the hardships of the Dust Bowl and the Great Depression, this was a wondrous opportunity for employment. And workers swarmed in. They slept in cars, they stayed in little uh, mobile home parks. We didn't have motels in those days. And the only hotel in town, carpenters and electricians and uh, build, uh, bulldozer operators and plumbers came in, just far exceeding the population that was there. But they began to install utilities and roads to hammer together partitions or platforms for tents and for Quonset huts, gymnasiums, and chapels. Oh yes, old Hilter was changing the lives of us all. A knock on our front door took Mama to the front and she stood inside the screen and she faced a young man who was about the age of some of her sons and he said, Ms. Lanford, they tell me that you have may have space and I've looked everywhere and I can't find any. My fiance Johnny is due in on the bus and we want to get married by the justice of the peace and we don't have a place to sleep tonight. Mama took pity on him. He seemed like a decent young guy. And so they spent their wedding night in our back bedroom. And within a short time, Hayden and Johnny had become a part of our family. It was an exciting time. So many things going on just to the uh, south of us as the camp was being constructed. The fall was unusually rainy for West Texas. It was normally quite dry there. But quagmires filled the job site and contractors were soon calling it, instead of Camp Bowie, it was Camp Boggy. Or Camp Gooey, I believe they called it. Very few facilities were completed before thousands of young men were shipped in. They were all in khaki. They talked funny. Some of them from Brooklyn, some of them from Boise. Oh, some of them from Bangor. In their off-duty hours, it didn't take long at all for them to exhaust all of the opportunities for entertainment in their off-duty hours. They circled the, the uh, courthouse square. They saw both of the movies in town. And it wasn't long until some had located an enterprising druggist who was able to reach below the counter to find whiskey. Uh, which he sold to them for medicinal purposes, you understand. That whole part of Texas had been dry since Prohibition was repealed. The closest beer was 75 miles away. The closest hard liquor, 120 miles. So farmers' wives kept close watch on any daughter 13 years and older. Papa persuaded authorities that I was vital to the effort and got me a driver's license at the age of 12. After all, I'd been plowing with our old farm all tractor since I was nine with no power equipment of any kind, cranking, double clutching, shifting gears, and even steering the, that 
clumsy old tractor took all the strength a boy could muster. But I'd been milking for some time, so had a few muscles. Still, I was an awkward boy, awed by the special people, the Washingtons, who had moved in with us. After all, they'd been around, especially Johnny, who I thought was beautiful as a movie star. She may have been 19. Christmas of 1940 was upon us, and I came in from chores. Company filled the house, which was decorated with greenery and tinsel. I heard my name called, but because I reeked of barnyard smells, I halted in the doorway. Johnny was stationed there. And she kissed me with a smack that everyone heard. I was there under the honeysuckle. But right in front of everyone, I blushed down to my toes while the room full of witnesses were convulsed with laughter. I had to grow up. How and old were you? Quickly. At, yeah, how old were you at that point? Let's see. <clears throat> 12, 13, but Johnny's husband was drafted that next spring and they left us. Our oldest brother Don was called to active duty and was sent to Hawaii. Academic programs of the next three brothers were accelerated at Texas A&M, so they continued schooling right on through the summers to graduate as early as possible. Used to having boys around, Papa picked up lonesome GIs, on, they didn't call them GIs in those days, uh, uh, boys in khaki, picked them up on the highway and brought them home to supper and Mama gave them all kinds of fresh produce and cornbread and clabber and while they were sitting there and the food was disappearing and they complained about the dry summers and the dull territory and nothing to do and little hick towns, Mama spoke modestly. I know some boys who would surely like to be here. In the spring of 1941, Papa leased a square mile of ranch land and stocked it with perhaps 65 head of Hereford cattle, maybe 1,600 head of Rambolet sheep. And since my four older brothers were in uniform, that left our one hired hand, R.V. Allen, Papa, and me, to round up doctor, castrate, and market the livestock. I took a liking to a blocky little bull calf, but hated the sheep. As a consolation, they let me have a wonderfully frisky, high-spirited, little spotted mare that was a joy to ride. I'd been on horses, bareback generally, and a lot of times barefooted, no shirt, since I could remember. So uh, I had no problem with horses. RV showed me how to fasten on shaps so that my legs wouldn't get lacerated with mesquite thorns and cactus uh, needles and, uh, oh, Burrs from the sheep's wool, they would have been bleeding. But yes, I was essential to the war effort. Rex and Scott came home on Christmas break. When Papa got a late night call on our old hand cranked telephone. The ranch is burning, boys. He called up the stairs. I'm filling a drum with water and throwing in tow sacks. All hands will be needed to fight the grass fire. 
with Scott and me in the back, clinging to the cab. Papa sailed through the cold night down to the place where we saw flames. We soaked the sacks and whopped at embers until it was finally extinguished and we were exhausted. The next morning, my brothers were on their way back to college. Eventual commissions and active duty. Mama saw an opportunity to gather her extended family for a reunion and invited them all to come to the ranch. The Lees came in July of 1941 from all over Texas, from California, from Chicago, aunts and uncles, beautiful young people of the most susceptible ages. At twilight, cousins pulled Fords and Chevys into the pecan grove and got Kay Kaiser and Glenn Miller on the radio. They danced by car lights as young and old tried to blank out thoughts of the war clouds. When the Japanese bombed on Sunday morning, following the first week in December. Communication lines were so crowded that we could only wonder whether Don was safe. We knew that he was with an anti-aircraft unit in Schofield Barracks up on the hill from the harbor. That was one of the few times I saw my brave mama break and cry. And it was all, it was very rare to see Papa take her in his arms to comfort her. Finally, after what seemed an incredibly long time, we learned that Don was alive and had only minor shrapnel injury. Sadly, Sister Lanch at the church had a son, Robert, who was on the Arizona. Years later, when I visited that memorial that straddled the sunken battleship, looked down through still murky waters at the vessel that had entombed many doomed sailors and I saw his name on the plaque above. I hurt still again for that sweet woman. Also, there was Jake McCulley, who had grown up a mile from us. As a little boy, I had seen him a real, real track star, stand up straight, they placed the bar on top of his head. He backed off a few steps, ran, and leaped over it. Jake died in the death march from Baton. Troops from Camp Bowie conducted war games all around us. With the blues and the reds, I think they call them, pock marking pastures for foxholes and trenches. When a careless road maintenance man caved in the bridge across the creek down the hill from our house, we kids were so excited because we figured here was a booby trap. The Blues or the Reds would capture the others there and we'd have a battle in our bottom field. We kids would have ringside seats. Oh, it was wonderfully exciting. Well, the scouts reported the dead end, so we were denied seeing any major battle there. The call went out for junk iron. 
So I drove chums around in our old Rattley GMAC pickup to pick up from gullies and washes old rusted farm machinery that had been dumped in to try to prevent erosion. We scoured the countryside for every scrap of metal. Wives contributed their old flat irons and we kids mourned when our old church bell went to war. We'd used a 300 pound relic to call hands from the field or to bring teenage hunters home. And when mama called, we youngins left the house to run out to stare open mouthed at a train creeping past, carrying half tracks, tanks, guns, and armored things larger than anything we'd ever seen. Jeeps, bulks covered in tarps. Surely a good thing that they converted that railroad from narrow gauge to standard back in the 30s, said Mama. I wondered if we were seeing our beloved old church bell, which used to call worshipers to peaceful assembly. Could it have been melted down and cast into some of those munitions, which would surely maim or even kill untold numbers? Thinly veiled propaganda films excited some of my chums, some of whom lied about their ages and showed up on, on the farm in uniform to the dismay of their sad mothers. Neither my parents nor I wanted still another son on active duty. Well, I probably couldn't have convinced anyone anyway, even though I was uh, I was 16, I probably looked 13 at the time. But in high school there, with the population of boys thinning out, the athletics programs suffered. I weighed 135 pounds, but was suited up to play tackle or guard in football, which was ridiculous. Things got increasingly more desperate, so rural schools agreed to have six-man teams with no bodies for substitutes. We played the entire game, nonstop. Some schools had not yet afforded gyms with showers, so cheerleaders had to suffer a hot ride home on a rattling 1930s school bus. But in the midst of sweating boys, I'm sure it was an odiferous time. Oh well, with air conditioning a luxury of the future, we kept all the windows open. Our family kept an eye out for the mailman. Old Mr. Bailey was faithful, getting there about 10 o'clock. But even though we couldn't know where our boys were. As commissioned officers, they were authorized to censor their own letters, but we still received some with scissored out lines. We came to recognize the voices of Kelton Bourne and Winchell on radio broadcasts and learned more world geography than we'd ever dreamed existed. We pasted saving stamps in books until we had enough to buy a war bond. 1750 would eventually give us $25. 3750 would get us 50. Big time. Many boys overseas provided all their needs, bought those bonds, and had a fair uh, nest, nest egg by the time the war ended. 
if they came home. I was asked to paint names on an honor roll. Someone brushed a five by eight sheet of plywood white and I alphabetized and painted names of all of the sons and a few daughters on the board to be painted, uh, to be posted prominently in our village. Sadly, some of those names had gold stars beside them. Papa got word that his first cousin from San Angelo had been killed. Much later, we learned of the tragedy of two of Mama's nephews. The brothers had been from a broken family. Their mother had taken them from my mother's brother and of all things permitted them to be adopted by separate farm families somewhere in the Midwest. They hadn't seen each other since they were little boys, but learned that they were fighting not far from each other in North Africa. Before they could be united, one of them was killed in a jeep accident. Rationing didn't hit us as hard as many in the cities since we were used to being virtual vegetarians on farm especially during the summers. Still, Mama kept close tabs on all of her books of tickets for sugar and coffee. Chocolate disappeared. I can't remember what else. There was a lot that was rationed. Rationing of tires meant that many were running on treadless rubber. And with gasoline, we were permitted to buy tractor gas in 55 gallon drums. Since they were too heavy for me to tilt, all too often I got a mouthful of horrible tasting stuff from trying to siphon it from that uh, big drum into a manageable can. Sam said, Papa, if you're taking the truck truck to pick up a girlfriend or two uh, for one of your high school get-togethers. A three-mile radius is your limit. Mean. Don and Scott were somewhere in the Pacific. Rex was deemed an excellent teacher, so was retained in Fort Monroe, Virginia, during the entire course of the war. Three sons in the midst of horrific fighting was more than enough. Men of the 36th Division who had begun training at Camp Bowie were among the GIs who hit the beach at Palermo and became the first to invade Europe. A heart-rending number would become casualties in the cruel, horrible battles that followed as they tried to make their way up Italy's boot. <coughs> Bob, the third son, was as unlikely a man to be in a war as you can imagine. Gentle-natured, he wouldn't hurt anything, much less a human being. But he was in North Africa, then was eventually a part of the freeing of human skeletons from one of Germany's concentration camps, one of the so-called death camps. That was such an emotional, an emotional experience for him that 40 years later, 
he could not bear to visit a Holocaust museum. He broke down and cried. VE Day and VJ Day were emotional, beyond what any can imagine today. A mix of jubilation and grief, of relief, of prayers and sharing. I didn't see anything like Times Square, but in our little country town, People that never had hugged each other did. And they shared tears, and they hooped and hollered and honked horns. It was unbelievable. The long ordeal was really finally, finally over. We had been a united people throughout that whole thing beyond anything that people can imagine today. No family had been spared, and people across the country felt that they were just one. We were to learn later that Don had been on Iwo Jima before the Marines went in. Somehow or other, they had set up an anti-aircraft little station on a remote beach there. My brother Scott, who was the fourth son, suffered shell shock, jungle rot, malaria, I don't know what all, before he finally ended up under medical care in Japan. He was in New Guinea, the Philippines, and I, I don't know where else before Japan. After he was sent home on a hospital ship, his severe migraines left him utterly helpless. He was unable even to turn over in bed. One night I was so scared that he was dying. I, I was petrified. He survived. He was given a disability. And he lived to become a successful rural mail carrier and a leading rancher in that part of the country with prize-winning Rambouillet sheep that year after year had blue ribbons pinned on them. My two oldest brothers became Uh, partners in a regional farm machinery dealership in Austin, Texas, which today is has hundreds of pieces of equipment. The third brother, Bob, became manager of a leading newspaper in Central Texas, in Temple, Texas, which is right next to Camp Hood. And it was there that I think in about 1980, some young whippersnapper in the office in a coffee break was saying, oh, all of this business of the Holocaust is trumped up, exaggerated. Bob didn't say a word, went home, brought back photographs of those horribly initiated prisoners. And he said, I took these photographs. Within a month following Japan's surrender, I enrolled at Texas A&M myself. I found myself 
marching to all meals and parades and drills. My days and nights were ordered from reveille to taps, played beautifully by a trumpeter that played clearly. We could hear that throughout the entire territory. It was it sent chills up and down your spine. I was there at the same time that the very first class of former GIs returned to school. They swarmed in and they were serious about college where we young kids had to scramble to try to keep up with them. There were some who were disabled. One in my class had bailed out of a P-38. That's one of the planes that had the double bodies and the tail that went all the way across. And they had not trained them at the time when they had to bail out to turn the ship completely down and they could so, uh, almost catapult out so they would not be struck. He did not know to do that and was caught across his middle by that cross piece between the two, I guess they're ailerons on the back of the plane. I could walk alongside him and all of a sudden a knee would give way and he would fall to the sidewalk. Those returning newly dismissed military men lived in tar paper shacks. A lot of them got married soon, but uh, they set high standards for us in college. The GI Bill was one of the finest things that was ever done by the U.S. Congress, and it lifted the entire country up through that generation by providing funds for them to go to school Young men who would never have had a chance to get a college education did and eventually became leaders in many, many fields in this country. Well, I received my commission upon graduation in 1950. I worked until I was called to active duty in January 1952. Happily, I did not have to go abroad during that war, that Korean conflict. But I did work at Lockbourne Air Force Base just south of Columbus, Ohio. I had a top secret clearance and I helped to prepare teaching materials and kept records for pilots bombardiers and navigators who were flying our giant B-52 planes. That was so pressure packed, I can't help but laugh in actuality at one of our, our teams particularly. This was a crew of men, a three-man crew, and General LeMay who was incredibly demanding, required that they qualify each one of them as a pilot, as a bombardier, as a navigator. Those poor men did not get very much sleep. And so one particular crew escaped in a little bit of silliness and I kept records for them as to <clears throat> when they had achieved certain uh, tests. And I had a, a great board on which I kept records and had uh, the names and, uh, and their tests, etc. And it was like a checkerboard. And as they came in to report, then I would chalk in that they had accomplished that task. And those three would come in, stand side by side, Erect as possible, and they sang, chalking in the squares, 
chalking in the squares, we shall come rejoicing, caulking. <laughs> Everyone collapsed in laughter. I was in the basement of the ops building, so didn't know when one of our crews crashed on the runway right outside the building. It was, it was a brief assignment. I was in less than two years because Congress cut the defense budget and they dismissed a bunch of us honorably, but very suddenly. And so that was the extent of my active duty in the Air Force. I, I was very happy to get out because I, uh, I was not cut out to be a military man. And so it was then that I got going on my career in architecture. Do you think it made a big difference to you growing up during World War II? Did it change what you would have been or what you, how you felt about it all? Oh, in many ways. Oh, yes. Uh, my father had gone to Texas A&M. Four older brothers preceded me there. I had ancestors in the Revolutionary War, in the Civil War. I had an uncle who was in the Spanish-American War. And uh, so it was, you might say, in our blood as a family, although we were not really military people. But I still feel very good about the military. The military takes a lot of young people. Uh, General Tommy Frank spoke about his being a wastrel in college. He flunked out. But the military taught discipline. It taught them to act in teams. It taught respect and honor and uh, so many good things that are lacking in the, in the careers of, of many others, in many other fields. But I'm not answering your question very well. We saw a lot of that as children, young people, teenagers, young adults. And we didn't question for a minute that it was a responsibility that we could not shirk. It was an opportunity to serve. We were a part of an extended family that went all across the country. Now, I did not see personally any of the Germans who were brought to Camp Bui as prisoners of war. There were some of Rommel's troops that were brought there. But we saw a lot of those young kids who were brought there to train. And we just saw an immense effort where people worked in harmony with each other in an effort that was greater than anybody could imagine. I'm not answering your question. No, I, I think you did a good job on that. It was a period of change. Oh my, it was immense change. And some of it was for the better and some, of course, was fraught with sadness and danger and all. It was a wide range of emotions that were involved. It was a very emotional time. As a family, do you think that any of them acted in ways that surprised you during it? There were some in town who said uh, about my mother, oh, Ms. Lanford doesn't let any of this bother her. Little did they know. She walked miles in the pasture 
to avoid breaking in front of other people in times when we couldn't know where our dear ones were or what kind of horrible conditions they were having to try to survive under. But uh, there was, of, of course, there were those who were opportunists, who made money that in ways that were not honorable. So the, there was a wide range of things that were going on. There was, there was so much that was going on, there was no way to control everything. The family was involved in a lot of ways. Yes, and my father was a man of such integrity who worked harder than anyone I, any man that I ever knew and helped more people, relatives, neighbors, anyone who needed help, uh, lonely GIs on the highway, etc. But he did not have anyone to dump on. He had people taking advantage of him, but he, through it all, refused to speak ill of others. He ended up getting ulcers because he, he couldn't share. He, he didn't have counselors. But that's a little bit off the subject. You think that's one of the strengths of American, the American people during that period of time? Yes. What a time. Well, I've given just a smattering of impressions, some memories uh, that are very personal and uh, don't know what else I might say. I think you did a wonderful job. Thank you. I am honored. Thank you.